السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم الله منشر علينا رحمتك وأنزل علينا حكمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام Today's subject, uh, Alhamdulillah, is about hope in Allah's mercy. And I think it comes in the right time uh, because of all of the struggles happening throughout the world, things that are happening in our own backyards, in our own family, and affecting the ummah in so many ways, and especially uh, the way in which our brothers and sisters in Gaza are suffering. It makes us yearn to see the manifestations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rahmah um, and to see that in, 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 in our daily lives. And it's days like these in which you have to dig deep in order to not only maintain your faith, but to increase it in faith and to increase in belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the source of all light and ease and mercy in the universe. Um, so that... So today is actually also very important because not only are we talking about hope in His mercy, but the way in which the believer perceives Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the way that you see His attributes manifest. Uh, this is hikmah number 48. This is on page 32 of Ibn Ata'illah's hikam. وَنَفَعْنَا بِعُلُومِهِ فِي الدَّارَيْنِ He says that لَا يَعْظُمِ الذَّنْبُ so of course there's normally a, a, a sukun there, it's majzum, but because because of two sukun, so it ends up having a kasra. La ya'dum dhambu indaka avamatan tasudduka an husni dhani billah ta'ala. Fa inna man arafa rabbahu istaskara fi jambi karamihi damba. This is really, really beautifully composed. If we were to internalize it, it would completely alter our perception of sins. He says, no sin you commit should be greater than your good opinion of God. Whoever knows God will see every small, every sin small compared to his kindness. So here it says, لا يعظم الذنب عندك so la, there's two kinds of la. You have lam and nafia for negation, and lam and nahia, right? So here it's lam and nahia that let no sin. Do not allow any sin to reach such great proportions in your eyes. Don't allow yourself to perceive a sin to be greater in magnitude than your good opinion of Allah such that it cuts you off from that good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For indeed, whoever knows, whoever has a good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's implied, that whoever knows Allah, if you come to know, if you have ma'arifa, if you have a good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how would you consider that sin? you would consider every single sin would be paltry, it would be nothing, insignificant, small, istasgara. It would be incomparable to the generosity and the kindness and giving nature of Allah Azza wa Jal. Now, the previous hagma was about sadness for missed opportunities for goodness. It was, abandon, it was about abandoning remorse. And so this kind of sets the tone. As we know, the Prophet ﷺ said that al-mu'minu bayna al-khawfi wal-raja. That the believer is between fear of Allah, that implicates fear of punishment, and al-raja, and hope in Allah's mercy. So what does it mean to be balanced? What happens when a person is imbalanced? What happens is that if you have too much remorse, because last week we talked about anadam, that the essence of tawbah is remorse. 
is regret. Because a person that doesn't regret what they're doing cannot improve. Because you don't even perceive what you're doing as flawed or as wrong. So accountability only comes with acknowledgement, to put it in modern terms, right? So first you have to acknowledge what you've done, then you can take accountability. So before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before you can ask forgiveness, you have to first realize that there's an error in your ways. But if you have too much remorse, if you're overcome with remorse, then what ends up happening, then the focus of your attention is not the one that you are seeking forgiveness from, then you're not focused on Allah. Then what you're focused on is the sins that you have accumulated, your own actions. Then it becomes about you. And this is very hard to get in the initial phases because, of, no, I feel terrible because it weighs on me, because it matters to me, because I feel a sense of guilt, because I sense, feel a sense of shame. And we think that that is something praiseworthy. But in fact, it shows a lack of humility and a lack of humbleness because it means that you've given importance to your actions more than they are due. Because then you think that your action is determinative, that there's a certain degree of a'mal that I could do that would earn me a status with my Lord. Then I would reach this maqam, I would reach this spiritual station, and then I would, I would rest on my laurels. I would be there, perched on that ivory tower. And then similarly, if you think that there's a level of sins that you could accumulate, that would rob you of Allah's mercy, then again you are giving importance to your own sins. That there is something that you could do that could negate the limitless mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal. That could restrict that which is vast. As the Messenger Sallallahu told the Bedouin man, he said, I have 11 children, I've never kissed any of them. So in one narration he said, you have restricted and limited that which is limitless. That Allah's mercy has no end. So too much remorse can be a problem because it puts you in this cycle in which you think that you can't be forgiven. That there are certain sins that are unforgivable. And so obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala softens the heart. And it puts the sins in the proper perspective. Because some people, they're so hopeful that they take their sins very lightly. And we're going to conclude with that point, inshallah. And then there are others who become overcome with that. And so we have to put that into practice. Let no sins in your eyes be so grave that it prevents you from seeing the reality of who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. And if you have that ma'rifah and you come to know Allah and His attributes, bi asma'ihi, in his beautiful names, bisifatihi, in his attributes that he has described, la thana an alayk. We cannot even begin to articulate praise for you. Anta kama athnayta ala nafsik. All we know about Ya Allah is the ways in which you have praised yourself. And we repeat those words. Because any words that we try to put together will be far insufficient to describe you. So this is another question. Why not forget about the sins? Why do we give it any importance? Why don't we just think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because that also is indicative of a different spiritual disease. Is a person who is unaware and heedless of his or her deficiencies and flaws. A person who doesn't have any fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The husnudhan, having a good opinion of Allah, is believing that He will forgive you despite who you are. Because of who you are, Allah will forgive you. It's not a person who's in denial, right? So somebody would say, well, don't even look at sins. But this is also flawed. Because then you're saying that your, your sins don't matter. But they do matter. But your sins do not modulate or change or affect the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is fixed which is as it is regardless of the level of your sinfulness and so that realization that I could 
I could sin twice as much or three times as much or a hundred times and it would not diminish Allah's rahmah. And so your, the focus of your attention is to be deserving of that rahmah. But not thinking that there is a level of sinfulness that will create a barrier, that will prevent you from having that. Why? Because you have husnul dhanni billah. Because you have a good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is what it means to have raja. That's what it means to have hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That once you really come to know Him, then everything becomes relative. So just as we come to know ourselves, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very weak hadith. We don't use it really as a hadith. But the meaning is 100% sound. You find it in all of the Sufi books. And it is confirmed by other hadith. I don't regard it as an authentic narration. That man arafa nafsahu. That the one that knows himself has truly come to know his Lord. Right? The meaning is correct. Right? Even though the narration is not. That if you know yourself, the more that you know yourself then you put yourself in comparison to the cosmos, to the universe. And what do you find about yourself? That you are insignificant. So as something is the numerator over the denominator, and it becomes smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, at it, what number does it approximate? It becomes zero. So then when you look at yourself in the mirror, you see yourself as nothing. Not because you are nothing, but because you are nothing in comparison to the rest of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So relatively you are nothing. But within you is everything. So how do you reconcile both of these? Within you is everything although you are nothing. So within you is everything because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instilled within you a mind and a heart and a ruh in which you can perceive haqaiq. In which you can perceive realities the greatest reality and the only reality is that of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah being everything, so within you is everything. And some people, they misunderstood that. In, in a matter of aqidah, people, they said this is wrong. Some people, they, you know, they're not articulate with words. They say Allah is everywhere. So we don't say that as a matter of aqidah because it's problematic. Or some people, they said Allah is in me. So this is problematic. As a matter of aqidah, we don't say that. But if you look deep within yourself, you find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is correct. Not in, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no physicality. So to talk about Allah in a physical way makes no sense. It's nonsensical. Because He is the one that created space. He is the one that created time. How can you think of Allah within space, within time? That makes no sense. But as you look deep in yourself, then you find that you are nothing and your sin is also nothing. So istasgara. So ista, every time you increase on the verb, you increase zada fil ma'ana. So it also increases in meaning. Istasgara, it means that you deem it small. It looks insignificant. So you don't lose hope in Allah's rahmah. So you might from time to time, you might remember the past. You might think about some mistakes that you made. Or along the way, you might have a zalla, you might have a slip up, you might make a mistake. And then you think, wow, I've been on this spiritual path. And then I did this. That means that everything I did was in vain. It means I haven't achieved anything. Or even worse, you might compare yourself to others. And this can be a very slippery slope. Because when you look at the ones who are better than you, what do you end up feeling? Sometimes you meet people, instead of being inspired by their hal, by their condition, what do we walk away? Because a human being can be negative. So we don't see people say, MashaAllah, I, I want to have more suhbah with them. I want to spend time with them so I can have the same hal as them. What do we do many times? Then we start beating ourselves up. We say, oh, I'm a sinner. I'm nothing in, in comparison to this person. Right? Sometimes we meet somebody and say, wow, I think today I met a true wali. And this is a sign of iman if you meet people and you see goodness in them and you see iman. And this is a sign of iman. Right? Because bad people only see bad in others. Good people, they see good. So if you see iman in others, this is a good sign. Alhamdulillah. But what if you come back and you say, wow, who are we 
in comparison to them. We're all sinners. Comparing yourself to others is a very dangerous practice. I know society is all about like don't judge and but I'm going a little bit deeper than like, oh, don't judge people. We need to go a little bit deeper. There are two possibilities. Number one is it is going to be demoralizing. You're going to sell yourself short and you're going to think that you're nothing, that you're a sinner. When you compare sin, compare yourself to those that are better than you. And the second possibility is that you will arrogate yourself. You will compare yourself to those who are in a lower status and you will say, wow, I am so much better than them. Right? And then you start to feel good about yourself. And many of us, we start to arrogate ourselves. We think like we're so religious. And then it becomes less about deen. It becomes more about tadayun, about the trimmings of faith, about religiosity. Right? And somebody might say, well, Imam Rifari, what you're saying, doesn't it contradict the hadith, the Prophet said, in matters of the dunya, look to those who are below you. And in matters of the akhirah, we should look to those who are above us, those who are better than us. That is beneficial if, if looking to others causes you to aspire, to learn from them, to acquire the traits that allowed them to reach that. But if you look and compare yourself to their state and come to the conclusion, if you're looking at them in the way of comparing, then now it is something harmful, right? So similarly, if you, if you look at the one that has more knowledge than you in Islam, in order to learn from them, that's something praiseworthy. So that way you want to compete with them in order to benefit yourself. That's a good thing. But if you compare yourself in order to grade each other, in order to compare each other, then this, this is a spiritual disease. And we seek refuge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's different from love and appreciation. Right? Even the famous line of Imam al-Shafi'i, he said, أُحِبُّ الصَّالِحِينَ وَلَسْتُ مِنْهُمْ I love the righteous people, even though I'm not from among them. Inshallah, in a couple of weeks, we'll be visiting the, the burial place of Imam al-Shafi'i which was built by Salah ad din by the way, who was a huge admirer of Imam al-Shafi'i, and we're a huge admirer of Salah ad din and Imam al-Shafi'i. May Allah you know, forgive all of their shortcomings and raise them in stature in the Akhirah. So the reason that we said all of this is because don't think that it's all about sins. Don't become, oh, because then it becomes like a board game. Then it becomes about points. You know, many of us, we grew up, we said, oh, if we do that, you're going you're gonna to get a guna, you're going to get a sin, you're going to get an ithm. And then if you do this, oh, you read, you read 20 ayahs, so you got 300 hasanat. And there are people who approach their religion that way, trying to quantify, trying to figure out how many good deeds they did and how many bad deeds that they did. Your sins are not determinative in the same way that your good a'mal, your a'mal salihah are not determinative. We know the story of the man from Bani Israel who killed 99 and how he went to the, to the rabbi and he ended up making it 100. He was in a state of despair. Why? Because he was unaware of Allah's attributes. He actually gave himself too much importance in the beginning that as an insignificant creation, is there something we can do that would prevent Allah's mercy from manifesting. So once you come to know this, then no sin will appear grave. But to answer what Sister Zamruda mentioned before, that why do we still need to see our sins? Can't we just focus on Allah? Because the sin is the thing that is pulling us away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The sin is the poison. So we still have to see its reality that it is that as the Prophet ﷺ said that the children of Adam, when they commit a sin, then there is a nuktatun sauda. There is a black dot that appears on your heart. And that black dot can destroy us. To view the sin as not just a sin that is a discrete amount that's on the scoreboard, but that that sin will now has created distance 
between you and your creator. And it has also enabled you to view sin as an option. So it has increased the distance between you and Allah, and it has also decreased the distance between you and repeating that sin. Because now, psychologically, you said, well, I did it last time. Nothing bad happened. You get used to the sin. It becomes normalized. You become okay with it. So now it becomes more possible for you to repeat. And that's why istighfar breaks that cycle. Tawbah breaks that connection. Because now you reaffirm you're coming back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Shafi'i, he said, وَلَمَّا قَصَى قَلْبِي وَضَاقَتْ مَذَاهِبِي جَعَلْتُ الرَّجَى مِنِّي لِعَفْوِكَ سُلَّمًا One of the beautiful couplets, he said that when my heart became hard and I couldn't conceive of where to go, I couldn't find my way, then I took my way as hope in Allah. لِعَفْوِكَ سُلَّمًا So I chose your pardoning as the ladder that I would ascend with. That was his escape route. He needed an eject button and he took the pardoning and the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as sulama as a ladder in order to escape. I perceived my sin as an enormity. He thought that his sin is so great. But when I compared it bi'afwika, Ya Rabbi, O oh my Lord, your pardoning, your forgiveness was far greater than the sin that I thought was so great. So you continue, Ya Allah, O oh my Rabb, to show so much pardoning for sins. And you continue to show generosity towards me and to forgive me and to give me well-being. Why? Minnatan watakaruma. Not because I have done something to deserve it, as a divine gift from you to me. And as a way that you wish to honor me with. I hope everybody's with me. Right? Because we 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 think that like there's something we're going to do and Allah will be good with us. And we think there's something bad we're going to do and then Allah will be angry with us. But that's not the way. This is, this is a, a way of approaching religion which is not the Muhammadan way. That Allah, the Prophet wasallam, he showed us that the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are many times in the moments of your greatest need. And sometimes the moment of your greatest need coincides with your most sinfulness. As the Prophet ﷺ, he said that shafa'ati li ahlil kaba'iri min ummati. One of the very important hadith from the Messenger ﷺ. I remember when I brought it up in the Sunday morning, halaqa, a lot of people, they got really confused and there were so many questions. He said, how could it be? The Prophet ﷺ, he said that my shafa'at is for the people of major sins. That doesn't mean that all of his shafa'at. What he's saying is that I have reserved. And when he said I have reserved, it means Allah has reserved. Because there's nothing the Prophet ﷺ can... People, they have separated the Prophet and Allah. That doesn't make sense. The shafa'at of the Prophet ﷺ has been given from Allah for him to give, to distribute. So the shafa'at of the Messenger ﷺ, he has reserved one category which is for the sinners. And not any kind of sinner, for the major sinners from the Ummah of Muhammad ﷺ. Why? Why Ahl al kabair Do they deserve it more? Well, they're getting all this special treatment. What about the people who didn't sin? Why do they need this special treatment? It's not a trick question, right? It's not like a, right? Why do the sinners need more of Allah's rahmah? Because of their sins, exactly. They're in trouble. They have sinned so much, they need more rahmah. It's not a trick question, right? Those that, those that did the a'mal in order to earn jannah, 
don't worry, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is going to be generous with them. They're good. They're good, okay? But we're not like that. So we're, we're from the sinners. So we're, we're relying on Allah's rahmah. And Allah's rahmah, most of it goes for the sinners. Because they're the ones that need it. And so, you, so the people who belittle their sins, they actually isolate themselves and take them away from the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So having that balance between fear and hope is so important. Now, I know it, it has become, you know, when I was growing up in the masjid, all you heard was fire and brimstone, right? The imams, they were talking about, don't do that, Allah is going to throw you in the hellfire. That they, they're like, you know, especially with certain things, like they're like, don't commit zina, you'll go to hell, right? But it didn't work because then people got desensitized. So we live in an age in which people have shifted, the pendulum has switched to the complete opposite. Now you go to the masjid, most of the masajid, you only hear about Jannah. You only hear about Allah's rahmah. Very rarely somebody will talk about the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is also an error. Because when we are weak in Iman, we need a little bit of a push. But it should not overcome us, such that we start to have su'ul dhan, that we start to believe that lie about Allah, that Allah wants to punish us. Allah created us in order to reward us. He created the human being to be the people of Jannah. He did not create us in order to punish us. The human being was never supposed to reside in the hellfire. And he did not create us in order to punish us. So we don't belittle sin. We tell people about the dangers of sin, but in a way that doesn't push people away. We tell them about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he's al-ghafoor, that he's forgiving, that he's halim, that he's all forbearing, that he's ghafar, the one that frequently and always forgives, that he's at tawab, that he is the all uh, dispenser of repentance. Qul ya ibadi alladheena asrafu ala anfusihim. Say, O oh, my servants, my dear brothers and sisters, is there any ayah in the Quran in which Allah addresses the sinners? This is a trick question this time. He doesn't use the word that, O oh, sinners. But are there verses in the Quran that are addressed to the sinners? There are. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way of honoring sinners does not describe them as that. What does Allah say when he's talking to the sinners? He says, my servants. He gives them the most beautiful title. And for my servants, that I am the all forgiving, the most merciful. Say, Ya ibadi, O oh my servants, wa ida sa'alaka ibadi anni, and if my servants ask about me, say, O oh my servants, the ones that have, and he doesn't even blame them for sinning against him. He says, Alladina asrafu ala and fusi him. Those that have transgressed against themselves in the third person. Those that have wronged themselves, not oh you that have wronged yourselves. Alladina asrafu la taqnatu min rahmatillah. Do not despair of Allah's rahmah. And that would have been sufficient, right? If that would have been a complete ayah. But then he says, Inna Allah yaghfiru dhunuba jami'a. Surely Allah forgives all sins. Inna hu huwa al-ghafoor rahim Surely he is al-ghafoor, the all-forgiving, the all-merciful. There's a hadith. إِذَا أَذْنَبَ عَبْدِي ذَنْبًا فَقَالْ When my servant... Do you notice this is the hadith uh, Qudsi, right? So again, Allah is describing the sinner as Abdi, my servant. He commits a sin, so he says, أَيْ رَبِّي 
أذنبت. So the servant says, Oh my Lord, I have sinned. فقال أذنب عبدي ذنبا فعلم أن الله يغفر الذنوب. So then Allah says, My servant has committed a sin, but he knows that Allah is the one that forgives sins. وَيَأْخُذُ بِالذُّنُوبِ ثُمَّ عَادَ فَأَذْنَبْ So Allah, He wipes it out. He gets rid of those sins. But then the person does it again, a second time. فَأَذْنَبْ Then He says, رَبِّي أَذْنَبْ Oh my Lord, I have sinned. So then, أَذْنَبْ عَبْدِي وَعَلِمَ أَنَّ رَبَّهُ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبِ وَيَأْخُذُ بِالذَّمْ And then He says a second time, But my servant knows that he has a Lord that will forgive him. And Allah wipes it out. In one narration, it's mentioned a third and a fourth time. Do as you wish because I have forgiven you. Now some people, they misunderstood that. They mean like, oh, just keep sinning. No. Well, if you knew that Allah forgave your sins, would you go and do it again? No. You would be like, I have the golden ticket. I'm not messing this up. They completely misunderstood the hadith that you would have a spring in your step knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven your sin. So act accordingly. Abu Hurair radiallahu anhi reports that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that by the one in whose hand is my soul, if you did not sin, Allah would replace you with people who would sin. So don't try to have this kind of purity that, or aspiring to not have any sin. They would seek forgiveness from Allah and He would forgive them. This is a Sahih Hadith. بِقَوْمٍ يَذْنُبُونَ فَيَسْتَغْفِرُونَ اللَّهَ فَيَغْفِرُ لَهُمْ in, uh, in the Imam Al-Busayri in his Qasida, he said, Ya nafsu la taqnuti min zallatin azamat. This is in the 10th chapter of the Qasidat Burda, which is the most famous poetry in Islam. Inna al kaba'ira fil ghufrani kallamami. So he says that, Oh my soul, don't despair from, a, from an error, from a slip up, which may appear at moments to be immense, even a kaba'ir grave sins. They've, these with Allah's forgiveness, they're just like a lapse. They're just like a small lapse or slip up. Right? So he says that everything that perhaps he means, I hope that the mercy of my Rabb, that when he divides his mercy, meaning on the day of judgment, then he will apportion his mercy according to the level of sins. This is one of the most beautiful statements I've heard in my life. He says that, if you truly understand it, he says that perhaps Allah will divide mercy according to the level of sinfulness. What does he mean? He means that the ones that need the most of Allah's rahmah will be the ones who receive the most of Allah's rahmah. So perhaps the rahmah will not be in accordance with the level of deserving that rahmah. But la'alla rahmata rabbi. But I hope that the level of mercy of my Lord will be in accordance with the need for that rahmah. The last thought that I want to leave you with is that a heart that is truly alive, it is sensitive to what pleases Allah, is happy with what pleases Allah, and it finds sorrow and grief with that which displeases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Man sarratu hasanatuhu wa sa'at sayyi'atuhu fa huwa mu'min. The believer is the one that his good deed brings him joy. And his evil deed brings him sorrow. So the believer, yara dhunubahu ka'annahu qa'idun tahta jabal. We talked about this last time. The believer sees his sins and imagines his sins to be like what? Qa'idun tahta jabal. Like a tower, towering over him, like a mountain. Yakhafu an yaqa'alay. Thinking that all of those sins are going to topple over him. And the disobedient thinks it's like a fly. It's no big deal. I'll deal with it later. 
So embrace that, that remorse, that being uncomfortable, embrace those imperfections, but don't allow that imperfections to create distance between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or affect how you think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but rather allow it to burn you in a way that protects you from the hellfire. I hope all of us can find a way to calibrate ourselves that we are perfectly balanced between fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and hope in Allah's rahma. Uh, before we do the adhkar, are there any, uh, any questions? I know we have... Uh, oh, when you connect back to Zoom, it disconnected me. But yeah, mashallah, I know it's a cold night. So uh, those that are on Zoom, if you have any questions, uh, now's a good time. And today we talked a lot about Allah's attributes. So the adhkar will be, will be invoking Allah through his beautiful attributes, inshallah. So Imam Rifai, mm -hmm. you told just now, you mentioned about Allah. We know that Allah, for example, I feel Allah is everywhere. Though it is no physical form. There's nothing wrong there in your statement. There is no physical form. I feel that Allah is everywhere is fine. But just now you mentioned that since Allah has created the space, Allah has created everything, it's not important, it's not necessary that <coughs> Allah is everywhere. Yes. If I say that Allah is everywhere, then I'm in trouble. Right? Because I'm teaching what? a class. But, so but, that, will, that will confuse everybody. But, but if you say that I feel no, that Allah is everywhere, it's totally fine. Because when we do anything, totally for example, we yeah. go for anything. For example, sometimes we may have to lie, Allah forbid. Oh, Allah is seeing us. Mm -hmm. Though the Allah doesn't have the physical mm -hmm. form. Yeah. Or we go for anything, for example, we teach, or whether we are honest in teaching or anything else, we keep in this in our mind that Allah is seeing. Right. Though it doesn't have any physical form. That's right. So, but you mentioned, no, Allah has created everything. But Allah is, <laughs> Allah is, Allah is not in the space. Allah is not right. in the mountains. Right. So what is, uh, what, how, why do we feel that Allah is, Allah is seeing me? Right. So it is, it is as though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is within us. Allah mentions that in the Quran. وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ That we are closer to you than your own jugular vein. But where's the jugular vein? The vein is inside of us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not uh, name something that is outside of everybody. He named something that is within us. And Allah says that we are closer to you than your own jugular vein. And then even what's uh, one beautiful way you can articulate in Surah Luqman. Luqman, he tells his son. He said, Ya Bunay. He said that if there was a tiny speck of a mustard seed, you guys know mustard seed, those that cook. I'm Bengali, so you know we know all about mustard seed, right? So we cook with mustard seed. So it's a very small seed. If that tiny seed is buried within a bedrock, imagine a seed within a rock. I mean, would it even be picked up by an x-ray? I mean, what kind of device will be able to figure out that that seed is in there? Or if it is up in space. What, no matter where it is, whether it's in the deepest ocean, it's in the highest mountain, it's deep into space. Not only Allah says that he knows about it, Allah can call it forth and extract it and pull it out at any moment. So when we talk to our kids, when we talk to our families, and especially kids at a young age, we instill with them that muraqaba, that feeling that Allah is watching over us. So we say, so when you tell a child Allah is everywhere, in order for them to understand that Allah sees you and Allah takes care of you and Allah watches over you, it's fine. But as a matter of belief, my view, and there are others who disagree, 
is that this is an incorrect statement about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to say that he is everywhere. So there's a problem with the question. The problem is not with the answer. The problem is with the question. So when somebody asks where is, and this is according to the mainstream, uh, you know, schools of Aqidah, the Ash'ari and Maturidi, and even the Atharis, they agree. All of them agree on this point. That when you ask where is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, some people they say up, some people they say everywhere. But I'm going to critique the question, which is that it implies that Allah needs a place in order to exist. And we think that because we, th then we have accepted the assumptions of Western philosophy. I shouldn't say Western, ph Greek philosophy, right? Not modern philosophy, which is that if a thing occupies space, then it exists. But isn't, a, isn't our existence, if you can compare our existence to Allah's existence, do we really exist? That's why one of the most powerful adhkar is that Allah is Hay, that Allah is Al Haq, that Allah is real. This is why, and before we, we don't want to venture too deep, but some of the uh, Sufi thinkers they said that uh, that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala's existence is real, and our existence is not real. Our existence is khayali, right? The same like word in Urdu. Right, khayal, right? So it means it's imagined, but it has a different meaning in Urdu, right? In Arabic, it means it's imaginary, right? So it's our imagined uh, reality. So, which by the way, I don't agree with. I think that we do exist, right? I think I'm here, right? You guys agree? We're all here. But there are others who said, no, we don't really exist. It's more a kind of matrix style, uh, you know, uh, aqidah, right? But I think we do exist, but our existence is contingent. Contingent, meaning that we only exist a hundred percent. Each and every second of our existence can only happen if Allah allows our existence to continue. Whereas Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala's existence is eternal, and it is fixed, right? So He has real existence in a way that we don't have. And so this is why there's a problem with the question saying, where is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because it implies that in order for Allah to be real and to exist, there needs to be a place. And it also implies that that place is within the universe, which is a created thing. And how could Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exist within the universe which he created, and he exists fil qidam? And he exists before he created the universe. So this is the problem. People start to answer these questions and they take their shovel and they start digging themselves a bigger and bigger hole and they never get out of that hole. So alhamdulillah, we're going to avoid that by just saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala laysa kamithlihi shay. And actually, it's, to me, it's more appealing to the mind and to the heart. To know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his knowledge, his wisdom, his perception, his control, ala kulli shayin qadir, it touches on each and every atom, and every electron, every proton, even on the subatomic level, on the, on the particle mat level, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala controls everything. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. And Allah doesn't have to be in it in order to control it. This is... This is the aqidah of the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. You know, and there are others, the, the Atharis, you know, they took the evidences literally, like our uh, Salafi brothers and sisters, they took uh, the evidences in the Quran and the Hadith literally, rather than having a metaphorical meaning. And they say that Allah is upon the Arsh, and so on and so forth. And this is also acceptable. I, don't th I think this is an error. I don't think this is the correct aqidah. But there's nothing wrong in that. If somebody has that aqidah, then the, the aqidah is also sound, right? And that will be within, within the fold of Islam and within the acceptable bounds to believe that. To me, it doesn't make any sense, but it is acceptable. Any others? Yeah. From now on, only easy questions, okay? None of these hard questions. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Yes, this is Sunny.
subhanallah. So our Sunday school sister Sonia is one of our most experienced teachers. She has a nine-year-old student that said that I, I'm reluctant to even say astaghfirullah because I, I have, I've accumulated so many sins. Subhanallah. Astaghfirullah. Yeah. And he's not mukallaf, which is important. Right. Yeah. So, so, yeah. I just don't, I'd like to know what your opinion I would tell him the fact that you're thinking about asking Allah for forgiveness is a sign that Allah has already forgiven you. That's what I would tell a nine-year-old because I don't know how many of us at nine-year-olds were thinking about asking Allah for forgiveness. So that is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspired, you know, and put in his heart. You know, we, we need that level of iman of this nine-year-old, right? But then the other thing is, is people look for signs and they look for signs outside. And most of the signs that Allah sends to us are inside, Right? So the fact that, and we didn't get to this hikmah, but the sign of Allah's wanting to accept your invocation is that he inspired your heart to ask. So the fact that he's asking about that is a sign of iman and it's also a sign of, of acceptance. And also he's not mukallaf because he's not responsible for his action. And that's why in that age period, this is a chance for them to gain maturity. And also we, uh, somebody like that, has to embrace his fallibility, that you are human, that all of Bani Adam is khata. We all make mistakes. And so the difference between a good person and a bad person is the good person is aware of their mistakes. Not that they don't make mistakes. And the bad person is the person that justifies it and says, yeah, but da 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 da. Or, or, but, but, but that other person is worse. They don't take accountability. So that tawwabun, khayrul khatta'een, at-tawwabun. The best of the ones who make mistakes, who are fallible, are those that come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if that were not the case, very, there are certain verses in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Allah loves. Allah loves. This is a very powerful word. Allah says, yuhibbu tawwabin I mean, did we ever reflect that Allah says that He doesn't say that He forgives. He says He loves the people that come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in repentance. So then we have to reprogram ourselves that when we make a mistake, don't focus on the sin. Focus on the fact that you're coming back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That sin might be the reason for your unlocking the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a good deed that makes you arrogant might be the thing that destroys you. And the sin that makes you do tawbah might be the thing that opens up all the doors of Jannah for you. So we have to change how we perceive things and to reprogram the things that bring us close to Allah are good. And everything that takes us away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is bad. So let's continue. Oh, mashallah. Mashallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase him and increase and protect all of our children and the children of Gaza. Please join me in, uh, uh, you know, we want to also do our adhkar and have the right mindset. Try to channel, as we're doing these adhkar, all of the beautiful attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah, 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 subhanallah. Subhanallah, 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 Ya Rahman, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahman, 
يا رحمن يا رحمن يا رحمن يا رحيم 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 يا غفور 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 يا ودود 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 يا غفار 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 يا ستار 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 يا حنان 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 يا منان 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 يا حي 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 يا حق 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 يا الله 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 
Allah, 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 La ilaha illallah, 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 Muhammadur Rasulullah. اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله May Allah سبحانه وتعالى bless you and your children and your parents and your families and forgive all of those that preceded you in Iman. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma farrij an Ummah Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma ansur Ummah Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah grant our brothers and sisters victory. May Allah prevent and alleviate and dispel all of their hardship and give them Fathan Mubina, may Allah give them a clear and great victory. Ya Fatahu Ya Alim, Iftah Lana Fathan Mubin, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive all of those who passed away, have uh, mercy on all of them, and accept all of the shuhada, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala heal, and may Allah alleviate the difficulty of all of those that have been injured. May Allah unite all of the families together, protect all of the orphans, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make these dark days end, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, fulfill nasrun min Allahi wa fathun qareeb wa bashir al-sabirin wa bashir al-mu'mineen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them a very uh, clear and a very clear assistance and victory. Subhana rabbika rabbil azzati amma yasifun. وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته There was a question here about which type of adhkar we should do every day. There are lots of adhkar. Imam Anawi, he wrote a book of adhkar. But the easiest one and that I recommend for a beginner is Al-Wird Al-Latif. This is by Imam Al-Haddad a modern uh, scholar from the 1800s, from Yemen, from the Ba'alawi Tariqa. It's very simple. It's according to the Quran and the Sunnah, and it's very easy. If you Google Wird Latif, you'll find it, a PDF of that. And it's a very beautiful one that you can repeat. Very short. It takes about 15 minutes, and one that you can do every day. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala benefit us all. And keep our tongues wet with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakallah khairan.